Notice that scripture passage which is to be fulfilled or which was fulfilled in the crucifixion of our Lord. They will look on the one whom they have pierced. So yes, they looked upon Christ crucified when he was crucified. But it, this prophecy applies to all of us today. We still look at the crucifixion, or at least Catholics and the Orthodox do. Unfortunately, our non-Catholic uh, Christian brethren do not look upon our Lord crucified. So. They will look upon him whom they have pierced, and why is this significant? Because it manifests his love to us. Now, notice when the, um, the soldiers, you know, they're sent by Pilate to ensure that they're dead or that they will soon be dead, they break the legs of the two others because they were still alive. So by breaking their legs, it means that they're going to sag down, and it makes it so that they will not be able to breathe, so they will very quickly suffocate. <laughs> In the case of our Lord, as we see, he was already dead when the soldiers came to him. But just to make sure that he was truly dead, they decide to pierce his side with a spear. Now, it's important to note that the Romans were experts in, in, in the, the art of being soldiers. And so they knew how to kill someone, you know, very quickly. They knew how to crucify people. There were different methods. We have archaeological evidence for different forms of crucifixion. They knew exactly what they were doing. So when they pierced his side, they would have aimed for the lungs, but also for the heart. And when we think of the human heart, it's the human heart that pumps blood to every other part of the human body. And so in many ways, it's one of the most important parts of the human body. And usually we think of the intellect or the brain. Um, well, there is a difference between the intellect and the brain. So the brain is the physical part of our ability to think. But we have the intellect, which also includes our spiritual part, our part of our soul. We, we view the brain as the higher part. But you see, the will traditionally is identified as being within the heart. And it's from the heart that we love, or from the will, really, that we love. But when people are in love, and you know, let's say they haven't seen their beloved for a long time, and when they see them, they will, uh, sometimes their heart will pound very quickly. In other words, the connection between the will and the heart is very great. So we can say it's not just the center of the body insofar as it pumps blood to the entire body, but we could say it's where the will pertaining to the soul resides in the heart. And it's from the heart that love spreads out. So the piercing of our Lord's heart served the purpose of ensuring that he was truly dead. But it also served the purpose of giving us the the physical imagery of this pierced heart with blood and water flowing out from, from the side of our Lord. So, in other words, we are enabled to enter through this wound into his heart, and his love flows out ever more fully from his sacred heart. Now, notice in today's um, response to Psalm, you know, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And this is from the book of Isaiah, but I think it's in Ezekiel. If you remember, Ezekiel has this vision with the water flowing out from one side of the temple. And he goes a certain distance, and it's knee deep, and then it's waist deep, and so on and so on. And then along this river, there's all kinds of, of trees and plants that are bearing fruit like every month of the year. And this symbolizes the crucifixion, but it symbolizes the love of Christ flowing out of from his heart, symbolized by water and blood. So Christ is the true temple of God. Remember how he said, you know, destroy his temple and I will raise it up in three days? Well, he was referring to the temple of his body. And at the very heart of that temple is his heart. So the water flowing out, which represents to us the life-giving sacraments, especially baptism and the Eucharist, they have the ability to produce fruit that bears abundance throughout the year, that produces an abundance throughout the year. And we see this in the lives of the saints. Now, 
theoretically, all of us could be saints like that. All of us have access to the saving graces that flow from God through, um, through the sacraments primarily. So uh, it's, it's kind of noteworthy and, and connected to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Now, in the, um, I believe it was the late six, 1600s, or like roughly 1690, that our Lord appeared to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque and he manifested to her his sacred heart. And the sacred heart that she saw was alive and beating, but it had the, the uh, wound in its side. It was surrounded by a crown of thorns. It had flames of fire coming from it, symbolizing the flame of his love. And uh, all of these things, you know, why does our Lord reveal his sacred heart in this way to St. Margaret Mary, Mary Alacock? Part of it was to enable her to understand the extent of his love and also to get us also to understand the extent of his love and, and also to make reparation to his sacred heart. So today is, is the first Friday of the month. And as you know, one of the messages of our Lord to St. Margaret Mary Alacock was the first Fridays of reparation for, the, for nine consecutive first Fridays, nine consecutive months on the first Friday of every month. Why should we make reparation or why do we need to make reparation? Because God has loved us so much. God has done so much for us, but we fail to appreciate it. We fail to give thanks. And not only that, we offend against God. In other words, here's this God who is so good, so generous, has given us so much, has given us life, has given us time, has given us the beauty of nature, has given us his divine son, has died on the cross for us, gives himself to us in Holy Communion, and it's kind of like we couldn't care less. Now, not you and I, but people in general, Catholics who don't come to church, Remember I mentioned, you know, only 11% of Catholics actually come to church on Sundays. So in other words, the, all of these are an offense to our Lord. And it deprives people of, of the goodness that God wants to give them. So by making reparation, we're also helping those people who are so far, far away from our Lord. And this is why we should do that. So, you know, you know, sometimes when it comes time for actually receiving communion, you forget that you, you're receiving to, uh, in order to make reparation to the sacred heart of Jesus. But if you just that, make that intention, if you make that intention right now, it doesn't matter if you forget right at communion time, because you're still receiving communion with the intention of making reparation. Yes, there's other conditions, but our Lord promises that when we do this, we will receive an abundance of graces, especially if we honor the Sacred Heart. The ideal is to have an image of the Sacred Heart in our homes. You know, sometimes we'll, people will put out the Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart uh, images of that. And, uh, you know, these are great ways for us to increase our devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, but also to imitate his love for us. Now notice, yeah, I wanted to draw your attention to today's second reading. Um, St. Paul writing to the Ephesians. This is what he says. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So that you may know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. In other words, it's not human knowledge. You can't acquire this human knowledge. God has to reveal this knowledge, but even though he has revealed it, we still cannot fully grasp it. In other words, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, and the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So, to know the love of God, and we don't know it, it surpasses our knowledge. So, to whatever extent we do know it, that's great, but we still don't know it fully. Now, those of you who saw that, that documentary movie that we showed, um, which was called uh, After Death, if you remember there, you know, there's one individual who after he comes back to life, he says, it's all love. It's all love. Everything is love. 
In other words, he understood the love of God. Everything is the love of God. All of you are the love of God. All of you are the manifestation of the love of God. Everything is the love of God. And it was Roy Schumann, a Jewish convert, who was granted a vision of God, who uh, had an encounter with God, and he, he was made to understand that every time in his life when he was in the, in the, you know, feeling down or were having all kinds of issues, that he was being held by God's love. He was surrounded by an infinite ocean of God's love at every moment in his life. And he also understood that whenever he had interactions with people, how those interactions would affect those people. In other words, if he did good, the impact on that individual and the impact on others who would, you know, uh, encounter those individuals, but also the negative impacts. And this was also brought out in that uh, video, um, in that movie, After Death, although it didn't go into such a great extent. So all of these things remind us that God's love is, is so, so immense. If we understood this and lived our lives the way that God calls us to, like, we would truly appreciate it more. Now, now here's another very important thing I want you to, to think about on today's feast is that, you know, think of little children. Little children love their parents, and little children know that their parents love them, and they rejoice in that love. But do little children understand the depth or the extent of their parents' love for them? And the answer is no. And as we know, many parents, they, you know, make all kinds of sacrifices for their children. I mean, mothers getting up in the middle of the night when, when, when the infant is, is crying and changing diapers and so many things, right? And, and you know, working hard for their children. Like, like children, they just don't really understand it all. They don't really appreciate it all until they grow up and they become parents themselves. And once that happens, they understand and they appreciate more fully. At least some of them do. All right. Now, the point I wanted to make is that when it comes to the love of God, we don't understand. But you see, when we practice love, the kind of love that Christ practiced, the self-giving love, that very act of loving, just like children when they grow up love their own children, that very act of loving helps us. It helps us to understand God's love. In other words, the greater the love that I have for my neighbor, the more fully I will understand God's love for me. And the more fully I understand God's love for me, the more fully I will love him. And the more fully I love him, the more I will receive of his blessings and graces and become like the saints. This is the reality. You see, it's all about love. There was an experiment done by the, the, um, the communists. Uh, I believe it was the communists. It may have been the Nazis, but I think it was the communists. But, you know, they, they took a child very, very young infant, and deprived it of all human contact. They gave it milk. They gave the child whatever it needed. They, you know, used rubber gloves and, you know, had a mask on and, and shield. And this, th these infants were deprived of all human contact, which means they were also deprived of human love. Those infants died. Now, Remember how I said the heart is the source for the pumping of blood throughout the entire body, so it's like the most important organ or one of the most important organs? But so is love. So in other words, without love, we cannot live. And you see, what is the reality of hell? It's being deprived of love, of all love. You know, imagine living in a world where you didn't love anything, and nobody loved you. Imagine how miserable you would be. Imagine how isolated you would be. Well, this is a little bit of what something that what hell is like. There is no love. There's no love. Even your attachment to your sinful 
pleasures of the old, of the past, which you loved. In hell, you hate them, but you're still attached to them. You still desire them for the physical pleasure that it might afford you. But, but you hate them because you know it's the source of your misery. You know it's the source of your isolation. You know it's the source of your separation from God. So without love, we die. But with love, we live. God is love. He created us in his image, and he calls us to life, to eternal life. He calls us to love. He calls us to love as he loves us. Just a reminder that we have the all-night vigil of adoration uh, this evening after the evening mass, because it is First Friday. And also tomorrow, it's... Um, I think it's just a memorial of the Immaculate Heart of Our Lady. And to honor the Immaculate Heart of Our Lady, at 4 p.m., there will be a living rosary conducted by the Legion of Mary. And, of course, they're inviting all the parishioners to participate in that living rosary tomorrow, Saturday afternoon, at 4 p.m.